Mr. Tarot, in this video we are going to work through two problems of finding the derivative of an absolute value function. Now so far in our textbook and in our homework that I'm using to teach out of, R, you may not be using the same book I am, but we have only found the derivative of absolute value functions at the sharp bend. Now that's really kind of incorrect because you can't find the derivative at a sharp bend, but we could use either the definition of the derivative uh, or the alternate method of finding the derivative, which is what I'm going to do in my example here, of finding the derivative of the function as you approach from the left and as you approach from the right of that sharp bend. So you can find out, you know, maybe to the left it's got a slope of negative 2 and to the right it's got a slope of positive 2. But what if we want a general form of the derivative, not just finding the derivative to the left and right of those sharp bends? Well, to do that, we need to understand a little bit about simplifying radicals way back in like maybe Algebra 1 or definitely Algebra 2. So, as far as reviewing uh, our simplifying radicals, we have the cube root of negative 2 to the third. Now, negative 2 to the third power, if you wrap that in parentheses like you're supposed to, here I have on my chalkboard, that's negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, which is negative 8. And the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. So we see that when, the, when, we are when we have something inside of a radical that has the same power as the index, it's just going to cancel as long as that power and that index are odd. Because, and we've been using that skill quite a few times uh, throughout our math career, third power, third root, written as a rational uh, equation, or excuse me, rational expression, we have 3 over 3, and that of course divides out to be 1, and we get negative 2. So that power and that radical are simply canceling out, whether we expand it or whether we write that radical in uh, with a rational exponent and let it cancel out that way. However, when that power and that root are even, something funny happens. The square root of negative 2 squared is negative 2 times negative 2 squared, and negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4, and the square root of, excuse me, the square root of 4 is positive 2. If you introduce your own even roots in your problems as you're solving equations, like you would have in Algebra, algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Pre-Calculus, if you introduced your own even root, you would have to count for both the positive and negative answer. If the textbook just gave you that radical, then you were to find the sign that was already in front of it. So when I have the square root of, neg uh, the square root of negative 2 squared with nothing out front, I'm indicating that I want the positive answer, and indeed the square root of 4 is equal to 2. However, if I try and do this little shortcut method that I did up here in orange with the odd power and root, and just say, okay, well, I know the square root and the square power of 2 cancel out. So, and a lot of times we take that for granted, but if I write negative 2 squared and then to the second, uh, uh, the square root, then that power of 2 and that square root, or that index of 2, cancel out to give us an exponent of 1. So we see that it appears uh, that now the answer is negative 2, but if we expand out, again, negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4, square root of 4 is 2, and then I allow the power and the index to cancel out, or the root to cancel out, I get negative 2. It's not the same answer. So, when you take an nth root of something to an n power, it is just simply going to be a, or the power and the root uh, cancel out if they're odd. If they're even, then you have to write it's the absolute value of a to make sure that your answer comes out correct, because the absolute value of negative 2 does become positive 2, and now it's not no, it's a wrong answer, now it's, you know, it's correct. So, we're going to use that little trick there, that little, not trick, but that rule that we sometimes often forget when we reduce radicals to allow us to find the general form, if you will, or the derivative of an absolute value function. So y equals absolute value of x can be rewritten as y equals the square root of x squared. Again, just like we have here with our rule about reducing radicals, or simplifying radicals. And you can then work through the derivative process with the chain rule. Now, again, we can't find the derivative at those sharp bends, but there's a lot of places in the absolute value functions where you don't have a sharp bend. So let me go uh, get my dogs to settle down and get to those examples. Alrighty then. Find the derivative of y equals absolute value of 2x minus 3 plus 1. Inside this absolute value function, we have a linear function. So uh, to the left and right of the sharp bend, we're just going to have straight lines. So actually, if I know what the derivative is just to the left and just to the right of the sharp bend, I actually know what the slope is. Kind of uh, an alternative way of finding this particular answer, and I'll show that, show that to you when we're done. 
But I want to find the derivative, and like the derivative so it describes the slope everywhere besides just to the left and right of that sharp bend. So we're going to write this as y is equal to the square root of 2x minus 3 squared plus 1. Then we're going to rewrite that radical to be a rational exponent. So we have y is equal to, we've got, I don't need to write two parentheses, 2x minus 3 squared, actually yes I do, raised to the 1 half power plus 1. Now I'm not going to take the, the exponent of 2 and this exponent of 1, I'm not going to do the power to power rule and write that as 2 over 2, which is 1, because I'm then I would just be letting the power and the radical cancel out and I'd be defeating the purpose of this example. And plus I wouldn't get my, you know, really my answer. Okay, so we're going to walk through the chain rule. So we have y, or uh, y prime, or the derivative of y, is equal to, okay, so we're going to take this exponent of 1 half, we're going to drop it down. Of course, that's going to decrease, uh, decrease this exponent by 1. The derivative of a constant is 0, so that plus 1 is gone in terms of the derivative anyway. And then we got the, of course, the chain rule, the, or the general power rule, either way you look at it. We're going to take that exponent, bring it down, subtract by 1, and then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And just to show all my steps, I'm going to go ahead and do d dx of 2x minus 3 squared. Now I'm going to find the derivative of that inside function, which is going to be the chain rule again, but I'm not going to do this twice. So we have y prime. I'm going to do another thing as well. I'm going to go ahead and take this 2x minus 3 squared is in this uh, power of negative 1 half. So I'm going to go ahead and let that, that expression with that negative exponent drop down into the denominator and go ahead and write it at, back in as a square root symbol. So we have 1 over 2 times the square root of 2x minus 3 squared. And then the derivative of 2x minus 3 squared, we're going to take that exponent, drop it down. Decrease that exponent by 1, and then again multiply by the derivative of the inside function again, or d over dx of 2x minus 3, but the derivative of 2x minus 3 is going to be equal to 2. Okay, so now we've got, and I just want to clean this up all at once, so I have two factors of 2 and one factor of 2 in the denominator, so one of those are going to cancel out, and we end up with, I'm trying to decide if I can squeeze it in down here, actually, no reason to do that. I can erase my chalkboard for the next screen. So we have y prime is equal to 2 times 2x minus 3 over the square root of 2x minus 3 squared, which then becomes, I put the absolute value function back in, y prime is equal to 2 times 2x minus 3 over the absolute value of 2x minus 3. 3. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to draw the original function and I want to draw the derivative here. And to do that I want to go ahead and pause the video so you don't have to watch me, you know, draw some x and y axes and tick marks. Uh, put both of these up here at the same function and kind of describe where they came from and how they relate to each other. Now to get this graph, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can just do t-tables if you like. Or even better, as a math teacher, we'd like you to know, you know, how the, the transformations, how you can take a parent function and quickly sketch um, a function from that. So this is a, an absolute value function, again, with a linear function inside the absolute value. So its parent function is y equals uh, absolute value of x. Now if I take this function and I factor out a 2, I get y equals the absolute value of 2, parentheses, x minus 3 halves, and then, you know, close it, absolute value plus 1. So the difference between our function and our problem and the parent function is we have a horizontal shift to the right of 3 over 2. So we have the, the sharp bend at that x value of 1.5 or 3 halves. And a plus 1, we have a plus or minus that's not inside the main function, that's a vertical shift. So the plus 1 moves it up 1. So where this has a sharp bend at 0, 0, this has a sharp bend 3.5 units to the right and up 1. And then our 2 out front well, in this format, if you think back to your, say, graphing trig functions in pre-calculus or trigonometry, you know that you have, this would be like uh, your, your, 
Well, my tux buck would call it a coefficient of b, and it would affect the period, it would affect the horizontal stretch of the graph, and if you have a multiple that's greater than 1, it pushes the graph together, or trig functions re would reduce the period. I mean, it's true, but it honestly is a little bit easier if you go back here and go, hey, this is 2x minus 3, this is a linear function, this is a line with a slope of 2, and you can see if I go up 2 and over 1, and up 2 to the left 1, uh, then I've got my slope happening here, and of, and of course we have a negative and positive slope because of the sharp bend that's occurring at the absolute value function, or actually at where the inside function is equal to 0, which, hey, by the way, is equal to 3 halves. Our derivative here, we can see graph. Now, how would I graph that? Well, of course, this I probably would just do a t-table for, and <clears throat> not really surprising here, we have a factor of 2x minus 3, and basically what's kind of a factor, uh, and you can kind of I can erase the, well, I can't just erase the epsilon value functions, but I can have, count for a positive answer in here and a negative answer, and, and this would cancel out. And Actually, maybe I'll go ahead and do that. I was going to talk about plotting points, but what is in here could be a positive value, and of course the absolute value of a positive value is still a positive value, like the absolute value of 5 is just 5, so we could have 2, uh, over 2 times x, 2x, minus 3 over 2x, minus 3. This would cancel out, giving us a value of 2, and that would be to the right of that 3 halves. If, I'm, if I use an x value that's greater than 3 halves, then I'm going to have a positive value in here, and uh, kind of effectively the absolute value doesn't seem like it's doing anything, and it cancels out and we get a slope of 2. Or I can say, well, I have this sharp bend, the derivative is undefined at that value of 3 halves, so let's test something to the right, like 2, and test something to the right, like, or to the left, like 1. So I can plug in 2 and get the same answer of 2, and it's going to stay a constant of 2. Or, if I use a value that's to the left of, or less than, 3 halves, then what's inside this absolute value function would be negative. Now when that factor of 2x minus 3 cancels out, I get a slope, or my derivative value is equal to negative 2, and thus we have negative 2. Or I can plug in, a, say, an x value of 1, work it out, get an answer of negative 1, and we know that these, and you should also be expecting this derivative to be horizontal because our original function is just linear. It's got a slope of negative 2 to the left and a slope of positive 2 to the right. It's linear, exponent of 1. So that slope is never going to be changing, thus our derivatives are going to be constant or a horizontal uh, line. Now, before we get on to our last example, I want to show how to find the derivative at a point, that point being the sharp bend of this absolute value function with the alternative method of finding, deri of fi the alternative method of finding the derivative, just to make sure you remember that from your, uh, what would they be about? About a chapter ago in my book. So I just want to pop this up here again, like I said, review an old skill. I want to find the derivative of this absolute value function at 3 halves. Now, 3 halves does, again, make this inside function equal to 0. That's going to be where the sharp bend is. So really, the derivative is going to be undefined at 3 over 2. But when you first learned how to find derivatives using the, the, the definition of a derivative or the alternative method, you had to find the left and right limit and show that they were equal. Well, they're not going to be equal, but I want you to sort of just pause the video and try and find those left and right limits using the alternative method and see what you get. You should get, you know, the negative 2 and the positive 2 like we had in the previous work. But just to make sure, I'm going to pause it, give you the solution, come back, make sure you got it right. So, I wrote out f of x, I wrote minus, and I wrote out the function with c plugged in, the 3 halves, simplified it, all this came out to be 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, so the, our, uh, we came to the limit as x approaches 3 halves of the absolute value of 2x minus 3 over x minus 3 halves, and again, you can't plug 3 halves in because the denominator comes out to be undefined. So, if you try and find the limit of a function and you can't manipulate it to create another function that is not undefined at 3 halves, then you need to find the limit using a table. Now let's not forget, I realize that this was a linear function, its, it's slopes are constant, so I'm not going to do a whole table to the left and right of this value, I'm just going to do one number, test one value on each side. So I took the 3 halves and I added and subtracted 
one tenth. <clears throat> just to show that I'm going a little to the left and a little to the right. Even though I just said this is linear and the slope's not going to change inside that absolute value function. Recognizing that it's really nice to know your parent function and recognizing that it's just a sharp bend with linear functions on each side. But at any rate, I <clears throat> really should have the limit as x approaches 7 fifths of the absolute value of 2x minus 3, but I knew it was going to run out of room, so I kind of just cheated and skipped a step here and said I'm going to let x approach 7 fifths. That's finding the, the limit as x approaches. Really what I'm doing is finding the limit as x approaches 3 halves from the left with a little negative exponent. Plugged in the 7 fifths, simplified, and got a slope of negative 2 like we did in the previous problem. And then I want to find the limit as x approaches 3 halves from the right. That's with our little exponent, which is a plus. 8 fifths is just to the right of 3 halves. Again, that's just 3 halves plus 1 tenth. And so putting the 8 fifths in, again, kind of doing really should be an x here. And then the next step, I plug in the 8 fifths. But simplified this out, and I got a slope of 2. Now, or a limit of 2, which is the slope, which is the... Okay, so the left and right limits are equal. Again, just verifying with that uh, alternative method of finding derivative that actually, yeah, you can't find the derivative at exactly the sharp end, and the left and right limits are not equal. Thus, the two-sided limit, which is originally what I wrote here, uh, right there, does not exist. But yet, I'm still validating the method I'm teaching you with those slopes of being negative and positive 2. Well, really, now the meat, even though I've done a lot of explanation already, what about a more complicated function that isn't a linear function in the absolute value function itself? Hmm, let's see. Finding the derivative of y equals the absolute value of x minus 2 squared minus 4. So it's a parabola. With its vertex, at least if it wasn't an absolute value function, at 2, negative 4. Okay, so it's a parabola, sort of. It's been broken by the absolute value function, but its slope's going to be changing all over the place. And I want a derivative that's going to give me the slope of this function everywhere, except at the sharp bends. So, and you can find those sharp bends by taking this inside function and setting it equal to 0 and solving it. It's going to be x equals 0 and 4. So we're going to, again, write y is equal to the square root of, and wrap all this inside parentheses, x minus 2 squared minus 4 squared. We're then going to rewrite this as y is equal to uh, x minus 2 squared minus 4 squared to the 1 half power. Now you can see this is going to have many steps of doing the chain rule. And I found making these videos that sometimes I can't get my mouth and my hand to agree, and there's no class behind this camera to let me know that, hey, you just wrote 2 and 2 is 3, or something like that. So I'm going to pause the video, and release uh, the solution one step at a time, and if you'd like to try this on your own, it'd be a good time to practice your chain rule and your derivative skills. I'll come back when I'm done and make sure you understand all of the steps, and this video will be done. Hope that made sense. If it didn't, here we go. We have that 1 half power again, which is the radical. We bring it out front, reduce our exponent by 1, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. That uh, exponent here is a negative 1 half, so I brought it down to the denominator, put the square root back in, and bring it to the denominator, got rid of that negative exponent, and cleaned up, actually emptied the numerator basically, so I could expand out this chain rule again. So we have 2 times and we got 2 times x minus 2 squared minus 4, and then again, the derivative of the inside function is showing all the steps of this chain rule, because there's so many of them. Then we have the derivative of, again, x minus 2 squared minus 4. Take this 2, bring it down out front, and we get 2 times x minus 2, and I'm actually applying the chain rule again, but the derivative of x minus 2 is just 1. So we get 2 times x minus 2 took this uh, binomial and squared it, got x squared minus 4x plus 4, distributed the 2 through, distributed this 2 through, kept expanding until we had the 8 minus 8, which was 0, so they cancel themselves out. These two terms both have a factor of 2 and x, so I factored that out and got x minus 4, 2x squared divided by 2x is x, and negative 8x divided by 2x is equal to negative 4. 
Then this factor of 2 cancels out with the factor of 2 that we have in the denominator. And then magically the 2 seems to appear again. Where did that come from? Well, 2x minus 4. I went ahead and factored that 2 out and brought it out and made that x minus 2. Now, our derivative is equal to 0, it would seem, at the values of 0, 4, and at 2. But if you take the denominator, take out the absolute value signs and try and set the denominator equal to 0, the denominator is equal to 0 at 0 and 4. So actually, the derivative is not equal to 0 at 0 and at 4. They are still critical values, but actually the derivative is undefined, as we know, at sharp bends. So I have our parabola coming down, and uh, the absolute value of x minus 2 squared minus 4 is right here, with this parabola that has a sharp bend in it, so it's really kind of like technically no longer a parabola. And in purple we have the, uh, the graph of the derivative function. Okay, well, that's the end of my last example. I now hope that you can find derivatives of, that, of absolute value functions on your own. I miss it, true. Go do your homework.